I definitely didn't feel like I had a hole in my life that needed filling. I wasn't like, oh, I'm missing something. Is there more to life? That I wasn't like that. Um, I was like, I'm fine. I like my job, I like my life. And then after I graduated, I moved down to London for a job. Um, moved into a flat share, and one of the guys I lived with was a Christian. And then there was like this niggling thing with this guy, who I was like, yeah, what's, what's this that he's got that I haven't got? And so the actual thing that sort of like challenged my life was seeing somebody live with more like purpose, joy, meaning than I had. Um, and so that was like the trigger that made me want to explore it. And he was the guy who persuaded me to, to try Alpha. I was really nervous. Just because I'd never really been to church before, I didn't know what to expect. Um, and I just didn't think there'd be anybody else there who was like me. And I was like, I want proper arguments. I want to like really get into this. I want you to persuade me. I want like the facts. I was surprised that week by week that it allowed me to sort of like wrestle with some of these things. And so when they said, now nah, there's a weekend away, I was like, okay, well, if I'm gonna complete this thing, then I wanna go on the weekend and I wanna finish it. And on the Saturday evening, we had this session on how can I be filled with the Holy Spirit. At the end of that session, the guy who was leading it said, if you sort of, rather than like talking about it, he said, if you want now to be filled with the Holy Spirit, put your hands out in front of you and pray and ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I had this like weird moment where I was um, gripping the chair in front of me, like fighting with myself as to whether or not I was like gonna sort of open myself up and like put my hands out and nothing happened. And so I sort of like walked out and I thought, well, there's two explanations. Either God isn't real and everybody here is in some kind of shared delusion. But I didn't really buy into that because I could see that it was real for them. Or God was real, but he just didn't want to know me. So I went back into my little bedroom where I was staying. And then I, I was like really wrestling with it. And I, it's really embarrassing, but I was like lying on the bed and I um, started crying on my bed, like face down on the bed. Uh, and then I like prayed for the first time. So I sort of said, oh, like, God, I'm really sorry that I'm this bad that you don't, that you want to know all these other people, but you won't know me. Um, but like, I think you are real, but I just want to like, will you, I just want to know you properly. So I sort of got this sense that I needed to turn over in my bed. So I turned over and then in that moment, somehow I just felt an overwhelming like peace. It was sort of like a deep down like joy. Um, and I just knew in that moment that God was real and that he loved me. Like it, it didn't answer all of my questions, but they just seemed so much less important. And so then I uh, sat up on the end of my bed and I was like, well, what am I gonna do now? So I just literally flipped my Bible open and read the first verse I came across, which was this verse in Romans, which says, those who live with the spirit desire what the spirit desires. And um, for me, I knew that I didn't have to do anything. I just knew that God would do the rest, that I just sort of had to say yes, and then God would change me and transform me and help me to live this life. Romans 5 says that God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. If I had to pick just one word to describe the Holy Spirit, it would be love. And Paul says in Ephesians that we should be filled with the Holy Spirit. The language he uses gives us the idea of something that is ongoing, as if to say, this is not just a one-time thing, but go on being filled with the Spirit. Yeah, and to be clear, Every Christian has the Holy Spirit living within them. Romans 8 says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. But not every Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the difference is kind of like when you go from low reception to full reception on your phone. When you become a Christian, you always have a connection with God because the Holy Spirit lives within the heart of every Christian. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is like going from one bar to full reception. It makes a huge difference. He fills our hearts with the love and power of God in an amazing life-giving way. And every one of us is invited to experience this. In the book of Acts, which is like the history of the church, volume one, we see five different occasions when people are filled with the Holy Spirit. And they represent five different categories of people. You may connect with some of these people. First, in Acts two, we see those who were longing to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
The disciples in Jerusalem had been praying and waiting and longing. And then on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit was poured out on all of them. And then in Acts 8, we see another group of people. Now they weren't necessarily longing for the Spirit, but we see that they were open and receptive to Him. And when Peter and John prayed for them, they all received the Holy Spirit. So if you're longing or open, you can be filled with the Spirit. But in the book of Acts, we also see those who are hostile, unlikely, and uninformed filled with the Holy Spirit as well. In Acts chapter 8, we also meet the person who became the Apostle Paul. Now at the time, he didn't want anything to do with Christianity, and maybe that's how you feel. But Paul was extremely hostile. He wanted to destroy the church, so he traveled from city to city, arresting Christians and throwing them into prison. But Acts chapter 9 describes how he was completely changed when he encountered Jesus. God sent a disciple named Ananias to him so he could be filled with the Holy Spirit. He got up, was baptized, and then immediately started telling people, Jesus is the Son of God. So in Paul, we see a man who's filled with the Holy Spirit, even though he was so antagonistic towards the church. On the other hand, maybe you've been to church or even go to church regularly, but you say, I've never really heard all this stuff about the Holy Spirit before. And that's like what we see in Acts 19. Paul's with a group of Christians in the city of Ephesus, and he asks them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. They were totally uninformed. After they were baptized in the name of Jesus, he prayed for them, and the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. In Acts 10, the Apostle Peter, who was a Jewish man, ended up in a house of a man named Cornelius, who was a Gentile, or a non-Jew. And Peter was sharing the message about Jesus with him and his family and his friends. Now, this was controversial because at the time, it was believed that only Jews could become Christians. The idea that a Gentile or a non-Jew could be filled with the Holy Spirit would have been unheard of. But while Peter was still speaking, it says that the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The Jewish believers who had come with Peter were surprised that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. This was a defining moment for Cornelius and his family, but it was also a defining moment for the history of the church. It was a moment God made it clear. His Spirit isn't limited to just one group of people. The Holy Spirit is for everyone. The Apostle Paul talks about God's love being poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who's been given to us. When this happens, when God's love and power fills our hearts, we all experience it in different ways. Everyone is unique. When people get surprised, for example, like at a birthday party or something, everyone's reaction would be different. Jason might get surprised and he'd just smile and play it cool. If I got surprised, I'd be jumping around, I'd be loud, I'd be throwing high fives and hugging everyone. Even though it's the same circumstance, the response is really different and unique to our personalities. In a similar way, people respond differently when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says that to, to experience the Spirit is like to be born again. It's a new, a new birth, in the sense that everything becomes alive. Uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't change anything, and He changes everything. It doesn't add anything to what Jesus has already said and instituted, but it makes all Jesus has said and done alive today. But this is what the Holy Spirit is meant to be. Uh, the one who accomplishes, who realizes, who reenacted the work of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is a relationship, a person. A person. It's a personal love between God the Father and the, the Son. And if human love can change the life of two people, imagine what does the Holy Spirit do with love in person, when he comes upon a person and when he, he is accepted, welcomed. Whatever the Holy Spirit touches, the Holy Spirit changes. So it is normal that uh, experiencing the Holy Spirit will, will bring some changes, even uh, in our feelings, in our emotions, in our uh, way of expressing ourselves. Uh, St. Paul says in the letter to the Ephesians, don't be uh, drunk with alcohol, with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a, is a friend. He wants to, to make us happy, to make us uh, enjoy full life. So I would say 
we should not be afraid of the Holy Spirit. It's normal that when, when we first approach the Holy Spirit, that there should be a reaction of our laughter uh, uh, or tears or jumping for joy or speaking in tongues. I myself, I must confess that the first time I was, I experienced this kind of presence of the Spirit. It was an irrepressible uh, desire of laughter. But I understood that this was a very special kind of laughter. Uh, the Holy Spirit is a spirit of, of joy, of freedom. It's marvelous to experience the Holy Spirit because where the Spirit is, there is freedom, says St. Paul. There can be a, 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 a more <clears throat> rewarding experience than to experience the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we experience the power and love of God in a physical way, and it's simply a sign of something deeper going on. And what God does in your heart is way more important than any physical experience. The cross helps us to understand God's love. Jesus died for you, that's how you know God loves you. But the Holy Spirit makes this knowledge alive in our hearts. It's through the Holy Spirit that we experience God's love for us. And when God's love becomes real in our hearts, the most natural response is this growing desire to express love back often in songs of praise or prayer. In Acts chapter 10, it says that those who were filled with the Spirit were heard praising God and speaking in tongues. Sometimes words aren't enough to express how we feel. I don't know whether you've ever been so thankful to someone that you simply couldn't find the right words to express it. Acts 10 46 says, for they heard them speaking in tongues. It's like they received a new love language. They were able to express gratitude to God in ways that were not limited to their own human language. We see this in Acts chapter 2, chapter 10, and in chapter 19. People were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. We wanted to talk about it because in the New Testament and in our experience, it's often one of the first of the more obviously supernatural gifts that people experience. Speaking in tongues is talked about in other parts of the New Testament too. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says that not all Christians speak in tongues and that it's not the most important spiritual gift. Then 1 Corinthians chapter 13 talks about tongues. Chapter 13 is also known as the love chapter. It's actually one of the most popular passages read at weddings. But I'm not sure that some people notice this in the opening verse. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. The New Testament talks about two different types of tongues. Occasionally we come across human tongues, where someone's given the ability to speak another recognizable language. But more commonly, it's not recognizable. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul explains, for those who speak in a tongue do not speak to other people, but to God. In other words, it's a way of expressing what you feel in your heart without going through the process of putting it into a language you know. Paul said that if someone is speaking in tongues in public, there needs to be an interpretation. But he said, don't forbid it. And in private, Paul encourages the use of tongues. He said, I speak in tongues more than you all. What happened on the day of Pentecost was tongues that were recognizable human language. Acts 2.11 says that the crowd heard the disciples declaring the wonders of God, and it was in more than a dozen different languages. You may have noticed that in this session, we haven't had any breaks for discussion. And this is because we wanted to make extra time for you, if you'd like, to pray and ask God to fill your hearts with His Spirit. I remember being at a weekend very similar to the Alpha Weekend, and a guy called Mike was speaking. He said that he wanted to invite the Holy Spirit to come, and I had never heard that phrase before. He wasn't asking God to show up as if he wasn't already there. He was asking the Holy Spirit to come and do work in our lives. And I remember standing there with hundreds of people as he prayed, come Holy Spirit, we wait for you. He encouraged us to pray the same, so I remember praying, come Holy Spirit. There's no pressure to force anything. He said, we don't hype the Holy Spirit up. He comes down. And as I waited, I sensed the love of God. 
After a few minutes, he encouraged some of the leaders to pray for people too. And so a guy called Luke put his hand on my shoulder and began to pray for me. And to be honest, I don't remember exactly what he prayed, but I do remember how I felt because I was overwhelmed with God's love as God filled my heart with his Holy Spirit. That night, God became real to me in a whole new way. And he put a dream in my heart to see others experience that same love too. There are three common barriers people often face as they pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus talks about them in Luke 11. The first is doubt. Doubt sounds like this. I don't think that if I asked, I would receive. Jesus says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. And you can imagine the disciples thinking, mm, I'm not sure. So he goes on, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And they're going, yeah, maybe. Maybe this guy, but not for me. So Jesus goes on. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Another barrier might be fear. Perhaps fear of the unknown, or maybe even a fear that if we ask for the Holy Spirit, we may end up with something we don't want. But look what Jesus says next. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God is a good heavenly Father. He's not gonna give us something harmful. Everything the Holy Spirit has for us is good. The third barrier is the feelings of inadequacy. We think, well, I'm not worthy enough. You don't know what my life is like. That's true, I don't know you, but God does and he loves you. Yeah, or you might think, but I haven't been a Christian long enough. God might give the Holy Spirit to a really good person or really mature Christians, but not to me. But Jesus doesn't say, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to really mature Christians or someone who's led a really good life? No, he says, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So let's ask. Why not take a few minutes right now as a group and make some time and space that you can pray that you may be filled with the Holy Spirit. One of the things that I like to do as I pray is to open up my hands like this. It reflects a heart that says, I'm open to receive. And as we pray, we're saying, God, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? 